And now it has come to us to stand alone in the breach and face the worst that the tyrant's might and enmity can do. Winston Churchill in the summer of 1940. Britain was unprepared for war. As the army retreated across the English Channel from the beaches of Dunkirk, many must have blamed the guilty men, the politicians who'd rejected vigorous rearmament in favor of placating the dictators. For the next half century, Britain's policy of appeasement was remembered with shame. But what brought Britain to the verge of defeat was not the guilt of the few, it was the collective illusion of a nation. Twenty years before the retreat from Dunkirk, the body of an unidentified casualty of the First World War was brought from the battlefields of France across the English Channel to Britain. Born on a gun carriage, the coffin was drawn through London and in the presence of King George V, the unknown soldier was given a state funeral in Westminster Abbey. In four and a half years, Britain had lost a million men. Never before had there been such slaughter. The shock to the system, the national system of the first war, had really gone very, very, very deep. It's almost impossible now, looking back, to think how deep it had gone. But that was the truth of the matter. And the trench warfare um, for uh, the last uh, four years of the first war had really bitten into everybody's soul. And they remember, of course, uh, uh, there was to be no more war. It was the war to end all wars. such a horrible war. The people that got killed, I mean, our own personal example, my mother lost her two brothers, the one 19 in the Somme, and Uncle Alf, who was a regular soldier, just come home from India. Well, he didn't get home, actually. They diverted him to France, and he went through um, uh, the battles, uh, early battles and that, and he got killed. And um, such a lot of people went. I mean, such a lot of young men were killed and, and the some and that, that I think people were really horrified and thought they'd never have another war. People really didn't want it. In those days, Britain was a superpower. The Union Jack flew proudly over a fifth of the surface of the globe. Her imperial possessions contained a quarter of the world's population. But the war had brought her close to bankruptcy. To cheer people up, the government organized an exhibition at Wembley. Its theme was the empire. It seems to me that someone must have said, now we've got this terrible war over, we must do something to promote business, trade, to let the world know that the British Empire is still alive and well, and to boost morale generally. And what better than a British Empire exhibition? The brand new stadium was the setting for the royal opening ceremony. The mass bands and choirs were conducted by the composer, Edward Elgar.
we were, of course, extremely patriotic people in those days, and the British Empire was part of our life. Patriotism ran through everything, like a thread through everything, through your school, through your family, through society. We thought that the Empire was a force for good in the world, a benign force. And we thought that the British were a little bit better than most people. In fact, the British, even working men, who at that time, many of them had rather a poor standard of life, were nevertheless intensely patriotic and thought that, uh, generally, that a Britisher was as good as 10 foreigners. To fight the war, Britain had mobilized five million men. All but a few were discharged. Despite the demands of imperial defense, there was no money to maintain large armed services. And besides, Britain, like other victorious powers, was determined to disarm, especially now that no conceivable enemy existed. The army was the first to be emasculated. To justify the cuts, the government adopted what it called the 10-year rule, an assumption for the purposes of military planning that peace would last at least 10 years. The Navy, Britain's guardian of the Imperial sea lanes, was drastically diminished. By the start of the 1930s, Britain was a weaker naval power in relation to her rivals than she had been since the 17th century, when her fleet had been defeated by the Dutch. Britain's most modern service, the Air Force, was all but grounded. When the First World War ended, the Royal Air Force was both the largest individual air force in the world and the only independent air force in existence. It had 22,000 aircraft on charge, 1,600 of them in actual action on the Western Front. And then dramatically, in two years, it had reduced from that 22,000 on charge to only 120 serviceable aircraft in the whole of the Royal Air Force. Tremendous drop. And aircraft, of course, were being scrapped, chopped up, burned in every direction. You could buy a SE-5 fighter for five pounds and a 504 trainer for joyriding for 10. Weakened by disarmament, the British put their trust in the League of Nations, set up at Geneva. The League was to settle disputes by arbitration and in the last resort would fall back on what it called collective security. In extreme cases, this meant joint military action by member nations. But Britain's immediate concern was the preservation of its highly vulnerable empire. By the 1930s, she was scarcely strong enough to protect even the British Isles against a threat from Europe. And that was only a first commitment. Another lay along the Mediterranean and the Suez Canal, on the sea lane to the brightest jewel in the imperial crown, India. Further east, and dangerously exposed, were Burma, Malaya, Hong Kong. The empire was hugely overstretched. It was in Asia that aggression began. In 1931, Japan invaded Manchuria, nominally part of China. Japan had been a British ally since the start of the century. But in 1922, under pressure from America, Britain had ended the alliance. With that, Japan became a potential enemy. But an even greater threat was emerging much nearer home, in Europe. Hitler gets a tremendous ovation when leaving for his first cabinet meeting. Hitler came to power on a promise to tear up the peace treaties and restore Germany's role as a major power in Europe. In principle, the British were sympathetic. There was a widespread feeling that Germany had been treated too harshly after the war. From across the way, Hitler appears at his window, and another milestone is marked in Germany's political history. I think people were concerned, but I can't say that they felt alarmed at that stage. I think there was a certain feeling in the country that uh, the Germans, one thing they do is love playing at soldiers. And as they had no soldiers, they devised, they took this the brown shirts and the Nazi movement was a good alternative. But I don't think anybody suspected that they would break out into something as terrible as they did. 
To the British government, a coalition of the Conservative, Labour and Liberal parties, the threat building up abroad was a long way off. The only pressing concern was the desperate state of Britain's economy, the result of the World Depression. The threats that were building up abroad were rather remote, but the economic crisis was immediate. Something had to be done almost overnight. Otherwise, we were told, not just by fools and people who wanted to frighten us, but by uh, the leading economists, the financial correspondents of every newspaper, appalling crisis is going to affect the British people, which will have a dreadful effects. That was an immediate thing, and therefore, for the time being, all the intention was concentrated on that problem rather than the, on the developing uh, European situation with, the th with its threat of war. The wartime government had promised the survivors of the fighting a country fit for heroes to live in. The pledge was not fulfilled. Industry had lost ground to foreign competition, and in the early 1930s, one in five of the working population was unemployed. Millions of families lived in abject poverty. So you saw real hunger. I mean, I, I've been really hungry. Uh, I'm not talking about starving in the sense of peoples of Africa, but I've known hunger pangs and not known where the next meal was coming from. And I've seen the desperation on my mother's face as to how she's going to feed five children and a husband. We used to go out and buy four pennyth of scrag end of lamb. And with that, my mother would make a big succulent stew which would last us two or three days. And I can remember coming home from school one day being really very hungry and there on the stove was this big stew. And my mother put a lid on it and started taking it out of the house. And I said, where are you going? And she said she was going to give it to a Mrs. Bushel a little further down the road. And I said, but I'm hungry. And I remember she slapped my face. She said, you're hungry, but they are starving. The strong man of the cabinet was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Neville Chamberlain. At heart, he was a social reformer, dedicated to uplift, prosperity and beating the Depression. He'd come to prominence as Lord Mayor of Birmingham, where his particular pride was a housing estate at Wheelie Castle, built to replace the worst of the slums. In 1933, Chamberlain went back to Birmingham for a special ceremony. The number of new council houses had reached 40,000. It was just like a little palace because we'd had nothing to see down there and the, and the house was dark down there where we'd get lights here and all like that. And it was marvellous to think we got our own things, we got our own toilets and bathroom and we could move. And if we wanted to wash every day, we could do and all like that. And it seemed such a godsend, you know, after waiting nine years. Remember when most every night at ten we sang an old refrain as we wandered in the moonlight down sunny side lane. We heard the merry lark, and if the night was dark, I'd steal a kiss again. As we wandered in the moonlight down sunny side lane. Hey, oh, the people must be strong and healthy. They must command an income sufficient to maintain themselves and their families, at least in a minimum state of comfort. They should be able to cultivate taste for beautiful things, whether in nature or in art, and to open their minds to the wisdom that is to be found in books. Chamberlain's priorities were soon to be upset. In 1934, a high-level government committee reviewed the state of Britain's defences. The report recommended greater spending on defence and the creation of an expeditionary force able to fight on the continent. It drew attention to German rearmament and identified Hitler as the ultimate potential enemy. 
1935, Hitler had been in power for two years, and the resurgence of German militarism was causing unease. Nevertheless, the peace movement in Britain commanded mass support for its campaign against war. Propaganda films denounced rearmament. I'd fight tomorrow if I thought a war would end war. But that's what they told my father in 1914, and we're no better off now. When there's a quarrel between two people, the police are called in to settle it. Why can't the League of Nations be strong enough to settle disputes between two nations? I was in the last war, and I thought that was going to be the end of it. Now, here we are again, back exactly where we started. Why can't the governments of the world get together to make war impossible? Right to your MP. The peace movement launched a successful petition. We got over 11 million signatures uh, for the peace petition, which is a significant number of the adults in this country. And that was the first beginning, I think, of the movement which was then to take over the 30s, uh, feeling against war. The, the fear was there, ticking away like a bomb all through the 30s. Uh, I think the peace petition began to make people feel and think about it. There we were marching and fighting to stop war, to demand that the government should form a pact with Russia and uh, others to stop Hitler. And yet at the same time in our hearts, I think there was a realization that the machinery was in motion. It couldn't be stopped. That bomb was going to explode one day. Neville Chamberlain urged the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, to come out for limited rearmament. But 1935 was an election year, and Baldwin was careful to reassure the voters. Above all, we desire to go on working to maintain world peace and strengthen the League of Nations. But it is clear from recent events that both our own influence in the world and that of the League itself will be weakened unless we make good the gaps in our defences. I will never stand for a policy of great armament and I give you my word and I think you can trust me by now that our defence programme will be no more than is sufficient to make our country safe and enable us to fulfill our obligation. That much we must have. When Italy invaded Abyssinia, the need to strengthen Britain's defences became indisputable. Italy had been an ally, and Mussolini's friendship was vital to British control of the Mediterranean and thus to the Empire's defence. A further threat now developed in Germany, where Hitler marched three battalions of the Wehrmacht into the Rhineland. It was a clear breach of treaties, but it was not unexpected. Britain and France had spent months discussing their response. In the event, they did nothing. In the words of Anthony Eden, given Germany's strength and power of mischief in Europe, it was in Britain's interest to conclude a settlement with Hitler while he was still in the mood. It was a classic definition of appeasement. I think that we, sh we should have stopped uh, Hitler, probably, when he, in he invaded the Rhineland. But there was a, a feeling uh, in, the, in Britain, certainly, that uh, the, the peace treaty had treated Germany unjustly. There was rather reluctance, therefore, to intervene on that uh, particular issue. The French showed no sign of intervening, whatever. And so um, the, the, I think the hope was, and again, the, it was a false hope, that... Um, if Hitler was uh, allowed to reoccupy the Rhineland, that that would be sufficient and that would be the end of his demands. That feeling was wrong. The opposition to rearmament was gradually crumbling, as Chamberlain noted at the annual conference of the Conservative Party. There could be no doubt in the minds of any 
members of His Majesty's government who were present of the determination of the great audience uh, to see the gaps in our defences filled at the earliest possible moment. As Chancellor of the Exchequer, I feel greatly encouraged and heartened by what I heard this morning. Parliament has decided that Britain shall spend 1,500 millions on arms in the next five years. Not directed against any one country, said the Chancellor, but because of our vast responsibilities in all parts of the world and as a measure for the preservation of peace. This means no remission in taxation, but it gives security. Even more than that, it will reduce the figures of unemployment. Security will bring prosperity. It was Chamberlain who made rearmament policy. The Air Force was given priority. Bombers and fighters would form a deterrent to enemy action against the British Isles. The fear of bombing in these years almost amounted to an obsession. Feature films added to people's fears. Even the service chiefs joined in. There is the possibility, they wrote, of air attack so continuous and concentrated that a few weeks of bombing might so undermine the morale of our civilian population as to make it impossible for the government to continue a war. frightened of bombing. That and the gas attacks. I know I thought about it quite earlier on about the bombing and people used to say, oh, with the world, what's it come, they'll bomb us out of existence or something like that. People were really frightened of it. Is London, the world's biggest city, defenceless against attack from the air? RAF pilots have been giving the metropolis an object lesson. The power of the bomber was constantly pushed right through the late 1920s through into the 1930s. And all sorts of bogus statistics were uh, traded about by which uh, London was going to be you know, bombed into ruins within a week and three million people were going to be milling about in the countryside and so on. And so you had a kind of conspiracy, if you like, of air marshals, uh, defence pundits and pacifists all saying that the next war was going to start with a colossal German strike at London and other industrial cities. The response of Parliament was to vote more money for the Air Force. A specially built factory at Acox Green in Birmingham. To meet the shortage of skilled labour, Aircraft factories were set up in the strongholds of the motor industry. Bernard Smith left the Rover Car Company to help set up one of the new shadow factories. The shadow factory scheme was a brilliant idea. It was a unique way of using the resources of an existing motor industry to immediately double uh, for example, the output of the Bristol Aeroplane Engine Company. The government were building these shadow factories, not that they very seriously thought that war was about to break out, but as a deterrent to the Germans. When I first went there, the factory itself was three parts empty, and there were very few people working there. Lots of jigs and fixtures and a few fuselages and wings. And we thought at the time, the chaps I was working with, that it was all a bit of a joke to be building planes. And we thought, whatever for? Because at that time, we didn't think that there was going to be a war. But British aircraft designers had taken the prospect of war more seriously. The result was the monoplane the forerunner of the aircraft that won the Battle of Britain. Now, the first of the modern generation to come forward in the great expansion of the Royal Air Force was Sidney Cam's Hawker Hurricane, and you see one here. The Hurricane was the first of the new generation of aeroplanes to exceed 300 miles an hour. Tremendous speed in those days. 300 miles an hour made it 
as fast as any competitive airplane anywhere in the world. And what's more, it had eight machine guns, which were deadly, and a great new advance in armament, together with this advance in performance. And thanks to the Hawker method of construction, an easy airplane to build. The Cinderella of the services was still the army. The chiefs of staff had pleaded for an expeditionary force able to fight across the channel. But the government insisted that public opinion would never stand for a continental war. We used to discuss the question in the office, to, at what point do, do, do the chiefs of staff resign? And we came to the conclusion that, that you didn't resign just because you disagreed with government policy. But if the government had the policy they weren't going to send an army to the continent, well, you had to accept that. They weren't going to send it. Uh, but if they went the other way and said you were going to send an army, but you can't have any more tanks, then you say, well, in that case, we weren't responsible. The army was in no position to fight a modern war. Finally, the battery is charged by tanks, bogus tanks in this case, and just as well, since the 18-pounders fire at them point blank. A direct hit, and he swerves to the right, his steering gear out of order. It was um, uh, quite an experience to be with the 1st Division, which should have been the spearhead uh, uh, of the force, who went, went, which should have stopped the German invasion of the Rhineland. And we had the, the same machine guns as we finished the 1914-18 war with, the Lewis gun. Uh, we had flags for men. Uh, I had, a, in my platoon, which should have been about f 45 to 50, I had three or four men. But we were essentially a cadre for reinforcing the Indian Army and, and our forces in India, and not a, an, a cadre for an expeditionary force I I in France. We relied on the French to do that. The public at large was blissfully unaware of the army's weakness. On parade for the coronation of King George VI, the soldiers of the empire looked magnificent. And in these years of illusion, that was all most people expected of the army. The British Empire between the world wars was really a facade, that it made us feel strong. There was all that pink on the map, all those dominions and colonies. But it was really a sentimental association so far as the white dominions were concerned. We had no common foreign policy. We had no common defense policy. We, there were no uh, operational plans for the fleets and the armies. And so really, the, uh, the, the empire existed only as a facade. And the sort of thing that we really saw most at things like jubilees and coronations on parade. <laughs> Chiefs of staff were only too aware of the state of Britain's defences. They now endorsed appeasement. Warning of the danger of a war in the Far East, the Mediterranean and Europe simultaneously, they wrote, we cannot exaggerate the importance of political action to reduce the numbers of our potential enemies. In 1937, the easygoing Mr Baldwin stepped down as Prime Minister and the ablest of his colleagues took over. Neville Chamberlain combined great drive with unshakable faith in his own judgment. It didn't take long after Neville Chamberlain became Prime Minister uh, for him to make it absolutely clear that he was indeed determined to be his own master in foreign affairs. And this was a big change from Baldwin, because Baldwin was absolutely bored to tears by foreign affairs and never took much action in connection with them. But um, Chamberlain proved very quickly that he felt very differently. Uh, and that um, he was going to be the master. He passionately believed that a combination of rearmament at a certain pace and getting onto better terms with the dictators 
was the best formula for peace. That, that was the root of Chamberlain's foreign policy. And at the same time, he agreed with his Chancellor of the Exchequer that over-rearming too fast could do great damage to the economy, which he'd nursed back to health. Now, that, it was within that framework, really, that every decision was made and what Churchill had called false, false measurements, if you like, were taken. For four years, Churchill had argued that the government was underestimating the pace and extent of Hitler's military preparations and that Britain had fallen far behind. But his was a lonely voice. Churchill did his utmost in Parliament, but he had a very small uh, following. And uh, he was a, a curious politician in that he had held every state department you can think of, and yet had not become prime minister because he, uh, he, he antagonized so many people whom he attacked where they were opposing him. I mean, when he was the treasury, he would hit the admiralty over the head very hard. When he was the admiralty, he'd hit the treasury over the head. They'd all been attacked one way or another, so they didn't like him much. And um, Chamberlain didn't want him in the government because uh, he didn't want somebody pressing all the time for more arms. He wanted somebody who would quietly keep that going and, and keep the, the Treasury happy about the amount of money being spent. At number 10 Downing Street, Neville Chamberlain was very much his own man. He had little regard for the experts over the road at the Foreign Office, who favoured taking a firmer line with the dictators. Early in 1938, Anthony Eden, the Foreign Secretary, resigned, predicting that with the collusion of Mussolini, Hitler would soon take over Austria. Germany moves into Austria, and these pictures will perhaps stir emotions in some of you which you may find it hard to repress. But sit through them calmly. They will teach us something, they will illustrate the seriousness of the times in which we live, and they will reinforce our determination to meet the difficulties of our world with courage. Britain did not interfere, neither did France. Chamberlain told Parliament, the hard fact is that nothing could have arrested what has happened unless this country and others were prepared to use force. He was determined that Germany's action would not deflect him from his policy of appeasement. Hitler had sworn to redress the injustices of the Treaty of Versailles. With his annexation of Austria, he was well positioned to tackle his next objective, Czechoslovakia, now threatened by German divisions from the south as well as the north and the west. The peace treaties had left a large and restive German-speaking minority inside Czechoslovakia, these Sudeten Germans now became the pretext for the war Hitler wanted to launch. In Downing Street, Chamberlain was determined to stop him. Late at night on the 28th of August, he decided to frustrate Hitler by persuading the Czechs to surrender the Sudetenland. He, Chamberlain, and not his foreign secretary, Lord Halifax, would play the principal role. Appeasement was his policy, and he would put it to the test. He wrote about his mission to his sister. Is it not positively horrible to think that the fate of hundreds of millions depends on one man, and he is half mad? I keep racking my brains to try and devise some means of averting a catastrophe. I thought of one so unconventional and daring that it rather took Halifax's breath away. The hour of need has found the man, Mr Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister. Since he took office... Mr. Chamberlain has never wavered in his determination to establish peace in Europe. At the hour when the dark clouds of war hung most menacingly above the world of men, the Prime Minister took a wise and bold decision. Well may we call him Chamberlain the Peacemaker. It's almost impossible to describe to people brought up in the jet age what the news that Mr. Chamberlain was flying to Bertus Garden meant to the British people and indeed to Europe and the world. It was a, a very brave act, morally and physically. He was, after all, a, a, an old man. And there was a tremendous mixture of feeling in the country. First of all, admiration. Three cheers for Chamberlain. Stunned surprise, absolutely electrifying shock. And perhaps most important of all, the feeling that all hope was not lost, that we were still in with a chance. Before he set off for his first meeting with Hitler, Chamberlain had told the cabinet that as a result of their failure to rearm, 
Britain and France were not in a position to fight Germany. They walked up the steps for the frank and friendly talk. Two men carrying between them the fate of 20 million. The Chamberlain couldn't negotiate from a position of strength because the strength was not there. So the, he went into the meetings with Hitler in a weak position and hoped, first of all, that he could buy time, but secondly, that he might convince uh, uh, um, Hitler that there was no conceivable gain to be got from war. I think those were his priorities. High up in Hitler's Alpine retreat, looking out over the Austrian Alps, Chamberlain told Hitler that if it could be done without force, he would not object to the detachment of the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia. Hitler gave Chamberlain a reluctant promise not to give the order to march. At their second meeting one week later, Chamberlain found that the stakes had been raised. Hitler announced that German troops would occupy the disputed territory in 10 days' time. Chamberlain was profoundly shocked, but he agreed to put the proposal to the Czechs. He returned to a Britain preparing for war, for the air raids all believed would come within days. The slit trenches in the parks testified to Britain's unreadiness. Well, I was writing stories about air raid precautions and civil defence every day, but there were one or two pieces that went under my own name. There was one, for example, where uh, I put the question, how strong are the country's passive defences now? There is only one honest answer. If peace could be guaranteed until the end of 1939, we could afford to view the rate of progress with equanimity. But for any emergency which might arise, say, before the end of this year, the whole of the civilian population, and London in particular, is still highly vulnerable. To judge from Hitler's behavior in Berlin, the emergency would come at the end of the month. But Hitler did acknowledge Chamberlain's efforts to defuse the crisis. Ich bin Mr. Chamberlain dankbar für all die Bemühungen. Ich habe weiter versichert und ich wiederhole Sie, dass wenn dieses Problem gelöst ist für Deutschland, es kein territoriales Problem in Europa gibt. Chamberlain was inclined to accept Hitler's ultimatum. But public opinion was turning against further appeasement, and the cabinet decided that Hitler's demands were unacceptable. But on September the 28th, the news reached London that Hitler had agreed to another conference. The Prime Minister was the hero of Europe. From the north, the south and the west, four strong men converge on the German town of Munich to make it for one proud day the new centre of the world, Mr Chamberlain. The Munich conference was an anti-climax. Britain and France had already conceded the Nazi leader's claim. Hitler was sullen. He'd been cheated of his war. That damn Chamberlain, he was heard to say, has spoiled my parade into Prague. Next morning, Chamberlain invited Hitler to sign a paper committing them both to the peaceful settlement of further disputes. Hitler was unenthusiastic. He hardly bothered to read the paper before he signed it. But to Chamberlain, the paper was a triumph, the prelude to a general settlement in Europe and even to peace for our time. He came home to scenes of wild relief. So our Prime Minister has come back from his third and greatest journey, and he said... That the settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem, which has now been achieved, is, in my view, only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. The British rejoiced. 
But Chamberlain's private view of Hitler was ambivalent, as he told Lord Hume on their way back from the Munich conference. I don't know if he ever worked out Hitler's state of mind properly. I think he, he, he told me, I remember coming back from the Arab, uh, in the aeroplane in Munich, he thought Hitler was the nastiest bit of work he'd ever had to deal with. But you had to deal with people like that in international diplomacy. And therefore, there was no escape negotiating with him. Um, is there a contradiction there? Did he uh, really feel that he was mad and, and yet negotiated with him as a normal human being? I think he felt that you had to negotiate with him. Even though he described him as mad, you, he was the leader of Germany and he was the only fellow who could say yes to peace or war. A minority was appalled. By bowing to Hitler's threat of force, Chamberlain had paid too high a price for temporary peace. I can't describe to you our feelings about Chamberlain adequately. I find it very difficult to find words. Uh, he was uh, regarded, I think, universally by working class people, and particularly by those who were labor inclined, as the, uh, as the arch enemy. And Munich for us was the climax. We felt that he'd betrayed the country, that he'd made war more inevitable, not less inevitable. They had a very powerful army, the Czech army, and they could have put up a good deal of resistance to Hitler, especially at that time, who wasn't fully armed and ready for war. But that all been denied them by this agreement. We'd bought time, perhaps, but they'd lost time. Con O'Neill was a junior diplomat at the British Embassy in Berlin. When the Munich meeting was finally over, I was so depressed that I sent in my resignation immediately, within the next day or two. I was glad then, and for many years, that I had taken that resigning action, but now I have to confess that I think I was wrong. I think probably we made certainly as good, possibly even better use of the year's interval in rearming, above all in beginning to get uh, our fighter aircraft into squadron service. The pace of Allied rearmament, especially of British air power, now overtook that of Germany. But its cost was a bigger worry than ever. The problem with rearmament from the British point of view was that we really had no longer got the financial resources or indeed the economic base to carry it on the scale that our defences and the imperial defences needed. And that was the absolute heart of the dilemma as to how much you did and how quickly you did it. And so you find, by the beginning of 1939, the Chancellor of the Exchequer warning the Cabinet that if even peacetime rearmament went on at the current rate, Britain would be bankrupt within about a year or two years. Once again, the rattle of a German army on the march echoes in Europe. Where that march may end, no man can foretell, least of all the man who gave the order. But here before our eyes unfolds the drama of a nation dying. Only five months after Munich, Hitler invaded what was left of Czechoslovakia. In Britain, support for appeasement was replaced by an almost reckless determination to resist Hitler's next demand. Even Chamberlain changed his tone sounding a Churchillian note of defiance. That was the German invasion of Czechoslovakia. Ask yourself now the question asked by the British Prime Minister. Is this the last attack upon a small state? Or is it to be followed by others? Is this in fact a step in the direction of an attempt to dominate the world by force? The British government now assumed that Hitler's next objective would be Poland. At the end of March, Chamberlain offered the Poles Britain's support in the event of a German attack. Giving our guarantee to Poland from a military point of view was a totally crazy thing to do. I don't know whether the Poles thought it totally crazy. I'm afraid I did even at the time because there was no reason to suppose that we could help the Poles effectively. And of course we didn't. But we had to this extent compelled ourselves to be courageous by giving that guarantee to Poland. An Anglo-French mission now arrived in Moscow in a belated and half-hearted attempt to negotiate a military alliance with Russia. 
It was intended to put muscle behind the guarantee to Poland and to reduce the military odds in Germany's favor. But it was the Germans who surprised the world by striking a deal with Stalin. Von Ribbentrop leaving Berlin for Moscow ushers in a new incomprehensible chapter in German diplomacy. Where is the anti-Comintern pact? What has happened to the principles of Mein Kampf? Equally, what can Russia have in common with Germany to throw over the peace front if she has? Newspapers were quick to fasten on the amazing turnaround in Hitler's policy, and one or two found a humorous angle to it. Neville Chamberlain's last diplomatic move had come too late. All he could now do was prepare his country for certain war. Limited conscription had been introduced. Volunteers rushed to join up as their fathers had done 25 years before. The army formed the expeditionary force the government had resisted for so long. On September the 3rd, two days after Hitler invaded Poland, Neville Chamberlain broadcast to the nation. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. You can imagine what a bitter blow it is to me that all my long struggle to win peace has failed. to Britain in the 20 years before the outbreak of the war and our finally getting into war at that time, a war which we could not afford to wage and which we were bound to come out of ruined even if we won it. The basic reasons for that were in the illusions of a generation on the one hand. Uh, you, you can't just single out guilty men like uh, as people have done, like Chamberlain uh, or Baldwin. Uh, this was a generation. They were partaking of the common beliefs and hopes and illusions of all uh, the whole broad spread of public opinion. So if, if anybody's going to be guilty, it is the illusions of the British people as a whole. United and in a mood of quite unjustified optimism, the British army is set off for France. It would be a full six months before the illusion of British invincibility was to be shattered by the threat of defeat. An empire has sprung to arms. Its gallant manhood marches through the roads of France, singing a new song in the old spirit. <laughs> <laughs> 